station, its staff, management, or sponsors. This is Talk 1470. Talk 1470. WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Welcome to the Caregiver Reality Show, hosted by gerontologist and family caregiver expert, David Levy, speaking on a topic that is not only a national problem, but an international one, and represents one of the biggest dilemmas facing us today, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. With no cure in sight and hundreds more being diagnosed weekly, Alzheimer's is more feared than cancer or heart disease. Join us as David Levy breaks it down and educates, informs, and explains useful caregiver strategies and techniques that 25 years of non-clinical family caregiving have taught us. You can listen or call in and be part of the show, 888-565-1470, to ask your questions. And now, here's David Levy. Good evening, Boca Raton, America and the world. This is the Caregiver Reality Show. I'm your host, David Levy. I'm here with my co-host, Paul whose voice is a little scratchy tonight, and he didn't even go to the Dolphins game and cheer. <laughs> I don't right. think that would have helped. Uh, no, I don't think anything would have helped. But, uh, you know, we don't discuss politics or sports because uh, it's not our expertise, even though uh, we're allowed to make comments about it. And, folks, this is uh, the 30th of December. Tomorrow is New Year's Eve. We watched the big ball drop in New York, and I understand that it is supposed to be a fantastic light show as well. They've got mm -hmm. something like a billion points of light. And, uh, you, know, it's, it, you know, when you stop to think how long you've been just watching that old aluminum ball fall down, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's really quite something. Anyway... Um, we're ending our first year, even though our year was 10 months, um, by way of just a little uh, history. I started out doing a few minutes uh, on the Freddie Fix-It show, if you remember that back in uh, February and March. And we got a good reaction to doing some caregiving. And so I went ahead and I got a half an hour so that I could uh, pass on my information and what I thought I knew. And uh, while I was doing that, I was very lucky. One of my good friends, business associates, and fellow caregiver, Paul Vadiato, said, yeah, I'll, I'll be co-host with you. And that was one of the best things that happened because uh, there's somebody else to bear the pain and agony every Monday. <laughs> but uh, it has worked out very well. And then in October, we decided that we couldn't talk fast enough and so we moved it all up to an hour and uh, for the last three months we've been doing an hour this will be our last hour show of 2013 but we'll be back next Monday with an hour starting out 2014 and who knows where we'll go higher and higher uh, higher and higher that's uh, the marching orders from Paul <laughs> and that's what we're going to try and do. We're trying to build our audience, and we thank you very much for listening as consistently as you have. Um, Freddie's been posting it out there in every conceivable spot, social media, etc. And uh, the buzz is on. And I think one of the reasons is because nobody's going to escape caregiving. I say it all the time, but in an aging society where we have turned acute illness into chronic illness, and where families are becoming more and more responsible for their loved ones, and I have a few comments to make about that. Um, it's no surprise that everybody we know has some awareness of caregiving. They're either doing it, did it, see it coming, or doing it again for the second time. And um, it's not only here, but it's around the world. Anywhere there's aging, anywhere there's chronic illness anywhere you see dementia and uh, believe me dementia as an umbrella uh, is starting to really spread it's more than just Alzheimer's Parkinson's and temporal frontal lobe disease but it's all that trauma all that Sunday football that's causing what we call chronic traumatic encephalopathy big word on the end but that basically means a shrinking of your brain and that's what's happening out there and it worries me when I watch 
uh, young kids playing football, you know, on the news every night, and uh, college football because they're hitting just as seriously as the big guys are. And uh, we're learning the hard way that our brains can only take so much. And even when we put them inside a helmet and try and take good care, when you get hit by a 250-pound person that is hell-bent on putting you on the ground because you have the ball in your hand or blocking you, um, there's a lot to be paid for it. And mm -hmm. uh, while you may be a hero today, um, unfortunately, you may be a candidate for a dementia facility tomorrow. And this is an issue that I think uh, the Football League and others are really going to have to contend with because a lot of the early football players that are showing up now with forms of dementia from all this head hitting um, didn't make a lot of money. They were the early guys in the game and so they're not your twenty, thirty, forty million dollar player and um, there wasn't that much money put away. And let's not forget our men and women coming back from war. Oh, without a doubt. You know, some of the most difficult, we watch the Wounded Warrior programs uh, that are being run as public service announcements and what have you, and we see them, unfortunately, with artificial legs, artificial arms, but we have no idea the essential issue of trauma both the kind that comes from being in a Humvee when it gets hit by an IED, an improvised explosive device, or whether it's just the trauma of war and seeing best friends killed or never knowing when the next incoming rocket is coming. And mm -hmm. it took a long, long time for us to discover it in World War II vets. They almost kept it to themselves until the very end. The Vietnam War, because it wasn't popular, we, we just sent a lot of people to the side of the road in tents uh, to deal with their PTSD and other war-related issues, whether it was mental or physical. And uh, that was very unfortunate, at least in this war or the wars that have taken place uh, since Desert Storm. Um, we've had a greater respect for those heroes and those men and women that have put their lives down or have been wounded in the course of action. And um, while we, we all need to give them our debt of gratitude, more than that, we're going to have to figure out a way to allow them to have as much normalcy as possible, to have a quality of life and some dignity. And it's one thing when we deal with older people that have seen at least a good 70 years of their lives but when we have folks that are 21 22 23 that left a wife and uh, and two young children at home and now they've got to face a lifetime with dad uh, possibly having all of the issues that we know are arising from having these kinds of traumatic injury uh, we better be prepared not only to have facilities for them and places for them and people for them because we're looking at 50 years of caregiving at a minimum. And we don't have that in place right now. We don't have anything in place right now, Paul. You know, one of the things that we discussed over the uh, this past year when we had Scott Solkoff, uh, the elder law attorney and one of the sponsors of this show who I'm deeply indebted to, but when he was part of the Purple ribbon panel yes. that was put together by the state of Florida to inventory what we did and did not have as a result of having as much dementia in the state of Florida. One of the things that we discovered is we really didn't have very much. Yes, we have some organizations that are very caring, that are focused on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other dementia. But really, when you look at the infrastructure for what we have, it's pay-as-you-go, and it ain't cheap. And part of the other problems are with the sequester and the cutback is when we really see the soft white underbelly of the system, when all of a sudden the public transportation goes down, when the senior centers have their funding cut back, when the philanthropy that we have come to rely upon is no longer as forthcoming because people have taken a big hit in their wallets, and while they still feel charitable, it's at much lesser of an amount than it might have been during the heyday of, of, of the boom.
And uh, I'm going to let you speak in a second, but I just wanted to conclude with one other thing. Uh, one of the follow-ons, and I was asking Scott last week, was, all right, you guys put out the purple ribbon panel. You identified that we needed to find out who were the caregivers, what were our resources, what could we do, what couldn't we do, how are we going to deal with assisted living facilities and the ones that do memory and maybe expand their licenses up a little bit, maybe let them accept Medicaid if they will so that we can get more people that have dementia into facilities. Um, and he said, well, there's a Florida legislative panel that's being put together. And I said, Scott, you sound too much like a politician and not like the legal crusader that I know who you are. So I'm not really sure where all this is going. And what it says is, if you're not an educated caregiver, if you don't understand what's happening and you don't go to people that do, and I'm not just saying people that you pay for, but quality support groups, listen to programs like this, and that may sound a little egotistical, but we're telling it like it really is. Um, I'm sharing from my 25 years, Paul, you're sharing from yours, and we're both sharing from our personal experiences. And I don't think you're going to find that anywhere else, because most folks that do these shows, and I take nothing away from them, um, may have a degree in something that relates to seniors, but they're not in the trenches every day with them doing four or five support groups a week, listening to the problems, dealing with it. I had one today. Uh, one of my clients from New York called and said, Mom's reached that point. Uh, I made some phone calls. I was very, very lucky. I was able to get her in at Arden Court down here in Delray, which I consider to be, along with others, a top-notch facility. And by the way, folks, I also heard from uh, Arden Court up on uh, Village Boulevard near 45th, and they've got a couple of openings. And so if you're looking for a couple of weeks respite, you know, Great. a safe place to put mom and dad, or you're looking for a permanent placement, give Sonny a call at 561 688 Nine 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 nine. You won't do better than an Arden Court facility, and there are a couple of beds available in Mid North County. So, uh, Paul. Well, you mentioned a moment ago the soft underbelly that people see, and I really question: Do they really see it, or do they just look past it? Well, you know that was an interesting comment, and my wife was was uh, watching some television the other day, and you know, like all of us, we have pets, and when they put on those pictures and the music uh, with the cats and dog, you, you want to go and adopt every one of them, and um, and yet when Alzheimer's comes out with those really hard statistics about the hundreds of billions of dollars that caregivers are paying for and uh, and all the rest of the problems that are going on and people flinch and maybe they'll listen for a few moments but then they'll turn it off but there's something about save the tiger and save the puppies but we're not doing very much to save the caregiver and uh, that's going to be one of the biggest issues in 2014 and every year going forward for the next couple of decades. But the unfortunate part of it is, David, until it becomes my problem, I don't want to address it. And that seems to be the way it's playing across the media, the perception that is out there. It's that it's in the future. It may not involve you. We have other priorities that might be ahead of this, but when it's in your home and it's a loved one that you have, that's the only thing you see. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we had discussed at some length earlier this year was the tremendous rise in the amount of family caregivers. It went from 30% of the population in 2012 to 39% this year. That's a 30% raise in just a 12-month period of time. And while it's not just related to dementia, it's related to autism, Asperger's, parents with special needs kids, early onset MS, bad car accidents, stroke. It, it, it manifests itself in so many different mm -hmm. ways. And no matter how much 
we think it's not going to happen to us. It's always going to be the other guy, the person next door. More than likely, it is going to be you, or it's going to be your loved one. Right. And if you're not prepared, if you don't have a plan for what you're going to do, when all of a sudden your world comes crashing in because your wife, your sister, your son, your child, whatever it may be, all of a sudden has a long-term devastating chronic illness or an accident, and you're the first line of defense, yeah, I don't care how good a parent you are. I don't care how good a spouse you are. We know. We see it. It grinds away on you every single day. And you'd have to be as strong in taking care of somebody as you have to be strong in taking care of yourself. And we can't repeat that enough. Matter of fact, I'm going to take one second because uh, there was a great article that had come out the other day, and it involved uh, Nancy Snyderman. Yes. Who is the medical correspondent for NBC. She's also a doctor. And um, she had been, and the article was entitled, The Myth of the Caregiver Superhero. And Nancy, who obviously I can call her Nancy because I've seen her on television for years, <laughs> even though I don't know her, but she was taking care of her dad, who was very ill. It, the illness is unimportant for the moment and here is a woman who had medical training who has resources access to just about everybody that she might have needed and made the confession if you will that she was burned out she didn't know what to do or where to turn and one of the big revelations that she did make was that the person that she had to save first was herself. We always use the old cliche about the airline and right. put your mask on first. But here was somebody who certainly knew how to go about finding things. And what it says is that caregiving, and I've said this over and over again for 25 years, has less to do with medical clinical and has more to do with practical problem solving, stress, and figuring out what it is you're going to do when it happens to you when it happens to your loved one, when it happens to your family, um, that's where the rubber meets the road. And uh, Paul, you and I have spoken about this often because we are caregivers as well as the fact we've had our wives on speaking about it. We pull no punches. We tell it like it is. And uh, nobody can accuse us of making up stories when we live it every day. Well, the reality is there are two people at risk. There's certainly the one who's, quote, in the bed, unquote, the one who has whatever malady it might be. But it's also the caregiver that is at risk. And that caregiver, as the stress builds and the demands build upon them, I mean, I, statistics are so high as to how many of spousal caregivers pass on before their loved ones. I mean, just scary. Well, not only is it scary because it's such a strong reality, but it's scary because there are things that people can do. But, you know, one of the things that we had discussed when you and I were doing our, our little conversation right. about m male spousal caregivers is, you know, and I put together a few things because we had discussed it earlier in the year. And men as caregivers, men have now risen to almost 44% of the caregivers that are out there taking care of family, loved ones, whoever it may be. So the myth of it being the old statistic of the 46-year-old female taking care of a 73-year-old mother has gone by the wayside with high button shoes and buggy whips. And today it's just as likely to see men as caregivers. And children. And children as caregivers. And one of the people involved so heavily with children is a woman who has really dedicated herself to an organization called the American Association for Caregiving Youth, a woman by the name of Connie Siskowski, who used to work for me in the old days and went off and uh, has been advocating for children who are caregivers because they are totally under the radar. Um, and they miss out on so much in their lives because mom can't be a soccer mom because Johnny's sick and they can't do the things that other kids need to do because they got to come home and watch their brother or their sister or their grandmother or their grandmother or their mom 
And, you know, one, one of the things we're seeing when you mentioned grandma is that a lot of families today, because drugs, alcohol, and disease are highly dysfunctional, and more and more grandparents are winding up assuming the responsibility of raising their children. So we see caregiving everywhere. The relationships are becoming more and more diverse. We're seeing young taking care of very old, old taking care of very young. And so what it says is caregiving has no rules. It has no age. It's a relationship and a role. You assume it whether you want to or not because A, you either love somebody and want to do it or B, there's no choice and you have to do it. Um, and so one of the things that I think will be the hallmark of 2014 will be our ongoing crusade to make caregivers aware of how difficult their job is but how important it is. And one of the things that I wanted to mention about you know, men as caregivers is one of the things, and I see it, although we get more men in our support groups than we used to, uh, men keep it bottled up inside. Uh, they think they can solve the practical problem with the skills they have. But there's nothing intuitive about caregiving, right? and you and I both know that. And um, so I, I know you had uh, you, you had a nice Christmas, but uh, your wife did too much, and so unfortunately, bounce back, bounce back, right? I know that story. Matter of fact, today. Um, on top of all the other things that uh, my wife is going through, the doctor informed her she really should have knee surgery, and we all shuddered at that thought. I just cannot imagine my wife going through that kind of surgery in, with all the other things she has. But uh, we have to do what we have to do. And that's always one of the real challenges as a caregiver is helping to make rational decisions in an, in an irrational environment where you're conflicted between the love you have for, in my case, a spouse, versus the hard reality of what that surgery might entail, what the care might be afterwards, and will the surgery actually make a difference? It is really difficult to do. I know I've had to do that a couple of times with my wife. Well, I think we've all been through that scenario. It's just that knee surgery is tough on healthy people. Anybody. Yep. The rehab and, is and so impossible. When, when you've got issues like she has, the thought of surgery uh, sends shivers up my spine. Um, men are much less likely than women to admit they feel depressed, talk with their doctors, or do something about it. Most men either suffer in silence, take pills, are drinkers, or just bear under the stress of what's going on and just kind of buck up and do it. But it's impossible unless you know what you're doing because caregiving isn't a disease, so you can't go get a pill for caregiving. That's true, and more and more of the recovery centers are acknowledging that problem of caregivers that are turning either to alcohol or to pills, and what had been one problem, perhaps the Alzheimer's, now becomes two, but the adult children, they don't even want to hear about the alcohol or the drug problem because they're overwhelmed with the Alzheimer's. And they also feel, and many people do, that if you become an alcoholic or a druggie, you had the ability to stop doing it. And we know that when times get tough and you reach for those kind of safety valves, even though it's wrong or misguided, you do it, and it, be it becomes a disease. It is the a disease. The disease of alcoholism, the disease of addiction, and it's not easy to walk away from it when your problems in caregiving are running 724. And along with that, with all of the isms with with the drugs and the alcohol it's a family disease and family disease meaning siblings children uh, in some cases parents everyone is affected 
by that illness, by that caregiving to some degree or another. The, the, the spouses of those that are caregivers, they have their own problems. I know you see that all the time in your, in your support groups. Right. Uh, Why don't you talk a little bit about that? All right. Well, we only have a couple minutes, but I will before we have to take our uh, station break. But I had planned on taking Christmas Day and New Year's Day off just to give myself a little bit of a break these last few days. And I must tell you that the phone, you know, it's seasonal for one thing. Everybody mm -hmm. recognizes at the end of the year that things have to change or that things are different. And, uh, but I probably had a half a dozen phone calls in the last 24 hours from my group saying, you have to come Wednesday. We, 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 we really need to have a support group. And so I sent out an email earlier today saying, we'll meet on Wednesday. We meet at Grand Villa, which is off of um, Via Flora and uh, Atlantic Avenue in Del Rey. And we meet in the Memory Center. And anybody out there that needs some support, you will find it categorically, no questions asked. If you have a loved one that you're taking care of and you feel overwhelmed, by all means, come to our support group. It runs from 9.30 to 11.30. We don't take attendance. Get there when you can. Leave if you have to. The only thing we ask is that you turn your phone off because otherwise we would be listening to a symphony for two hours. But everyone is welcome, and that's once again at Villa Del Rey in their memory center, which is right off of Via Flora on Atlantic Avenue, just west of Military Trail. And the audience out there, you're more than welcome. Please come. Um, and I'll, in the future, I'll be announcing other support groups that I do that are open to the public. And, um, and it's really important. It's the one place that you can get an emotional oil change. And just like Vegas, what happens there stays there. It's like a very large family that understands what you're going through. There isn't a judgmental bone in anybody's body because they've been there, they've seen it, or they're going through it. And all they want to do is be helpful. So anybody out there that thinks that nobody cares, that they're going it alone, forget it because we're there to help you. And so tomorrow, or rather Wednesday, New Year's Day, you want a resolution, you need to get to a support group, we're there to greet you. 9.30 in the morning, Grand Villa, make it a point to be there. It'll help change your life for 2014. It may not change your loved one, but it's going to make a big difference for you, and we welcome you with open arms. Anyway, it's 7 o'clock. Time to go to that station break. We'll see you right afterwards. You want to speak to us, it's 888-565-1470. Or post a message to us on caregiverreality.com. Anyway, station break it is. WWNN Pompano Beach, WKIS HD3, Boca Raton, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Hello, are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse, parent, or loved one who can no longer care for themselves? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Are you stressed, burned out, frustrated, and don't know where to turn? Have you realized that your doctor, lawyer, and mental health professionals don't have real practical answers. You need a non-clinical family caregiver expert that the professionals turn to. You need David Levy. He is a family caregiver expert with 25 years of active experience with thousands of family caregivers. He can help you provide a better quality of life for you and your loved one. Contact David Levy at dlevy at caregiveredorg That's dlevy at caregiveredorg or call 561-482-0086. And let's get your mental road to healing started. Well, we're back, and uh, that was our station break, and uh, we've got another half hour of information. Um, and we're going to hear from Paul right now, who uh, I have been 
talking over, and I apologize, Paul. We're going to make it a little different in 2014. I we have to those, share. I thought it was the new eyeglasses. No. But, you know, you would talk. Somebody called me Martin Scorsese the other day. Uh, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. All right. You know, you were talking about support groups before the break, and I think the supposition might be that people understand what happens at a support group. Why don't you just give a rundown of what actually transpires at a support group and what makes them as valuable as they are? Because I know you've been doing them for 100 years. Yep, and that makes me the oldest man in support group. Um, I will tell you that support groups, at least the ones that I do, mm -hmm. have very little clinical aspect to them. We're not trying to cure anybody. Uh, we recognize that everybody has stress and the reason they have stress is they're put into situations that they've never encountered before. One of the reasons is caregiving is not intuitive. It's not like when you get the flu and you're going to be in bed for a week and chicken soup and a magazine and you'll feel better. Caregiving for the long haul is a tough, tough job. And so one of the first things that we do is when we put together a support group we try and to some degree keep it a little bit homogeneous if it's spouses great if it's children of fine and so we try and at least get them in the same category so that there is a common bond that they're all taking care of wives and husbands to some degree we may do grandparents you know taking care of either their own child and when i say their own child i've seen 85 year olds taking care of 67 year old um, daughters and sons that have alzheimer's mm -hmm. because the other partner couldn't left whatever the story may be so our support groups start out uh... with an understanding that we start promptly and that everybody is there to support everybody else um, over the years you learn from watching people who come on a regular basis who really needs to speak who's there to listen and who you need to somewhat control otherwise they're going to try and dominate the group my job is to let no one really dominate the group and that's a hallmark of what we do the no one person gets to run the show except for me and while that sounds selfish um, that's your job I, that's my job and those that are new we normally ask them simply to introduce themselves they can use a first name and just let us know are they taking care of obviously if it's spousal caregiving you know whether or not the other person is a husband or a wife is it a first marriage and um, we invite them to speak however usually at the first time at a group people want to listen mm -hmm. they want to understand how it flows how it goes they don't want to expose themselves because many people the first couple of times at a support group have tried to tell their story to their friends and family and they burnt out their friends and family they can't hear one more word about aunt alice or what's going on in their lives and so they really feel that nobody really cares but the support group cares that's why they're there and we have people that are smack in the middle of some of the toughest stuff we have those that have lost their loved one have found others in their life are there to help give back the whole panorama of caregiving those are back at it for a second time those that see it coming but less of those that see it coming most of the time caregivers that come to a support group don't come anticipating what they're going to have to do they come a year or so after they realize that what they thought they could handle whether that's a financially emotionally family wise setting whatever it may be um, has gotten away from them and that to some degree their hair is on fire they're unsure of what to do somebody whether professional or friend has made a recommendation why don't you attend a support group and you only have one opportunity with a support group from my perspective to make it worthwhile because too many support groups people go in and say 
Well, I didn't fit in there. They were all too young. They were all too old. I had a spouse. They were talking about their kids. Whatever it may be, that's why they have to be kind of related in, mm -hmm. in to the same degree. We listen. We provide practical advice. We teach. We don't preach. There's no test. And I will tell you one thing about a support group is that not every person there is going through what we call a teachable moment. You know that as a teacher. Not every day you sit down in class, are you ready to learn or is it everybody ready to absorb what's being said? And so one of the things that you learn is that the basics, what happens with Medicaid, what happens with Medicare, what's the difference between an ALF, independent living, what, what does it all mean when it talks about activities of daily living? How does that differentiate from being in a memory disorder center or being in a skilled nursing center? Who pays for skilled nursing? We know a little bit of who might pay for it when you come out of the hospital and you need some rehab, but who pays for it when you've got somebody that has a chronic illness and has to be there? Because nursing homes are very expensive. Memory clinics are not getting cheaper, and any place that you find a facility are going to be costs and expenses that you hadn't anticipated, right. but you need to be aware of. So the, I would say in summing it up that a, care, that a support group is a safe place. It's a place where people can help you to understand, you, where you can sit and listen and hear what others have to say, and when you're ready to chime in, you will be accepted with open arms. And rarely do we have somebody leave a support group, at least none of mine, that say, I won't be back. And usually they'll say, I learned something today, and, and I'll be back next Wednesday, or I'll be back at the next group. I've been fortunate enough to attend a number of your support groups, David. And one of the things I notice is that you walk around the room, and you'll stop by someone and you'll ask a question, so how's your week going? Or how's things going with your husband or your wife? And it's open-ended and it can go anywhere where it needs to go with that individual person. Well, I've learned that if you sit at the end of the table like you're ready to carve the turkey at Thanksgiving, <laughs> um, it's it doesn't lend itself to the same thing when you walk around and you put your arm on somebody that you know mm -hmm. and, you, and you say sincerely, how's it going? Is there something you want to share? Did you hear something today? And people know that you're not just there as a facilitator, that you're there as a caring individual, as a friend. Most of the people in my support groups I've known for quite a while. I value them as friends. They treat me as a friend even though I kind of sum up the knowledge base that goes on inside of caregiving. But I don't flaunt it. I want people to feel comfortable and that they can contribute as well as benefit. And a lot of contributing is a huge benefit. There are so many people there that have benefited from a support group, not just mine, who feel how important it is to give back and to let others know what they've learned, that they've survived it, that there are things, just as when we had Barry on a couple of weeks ago, yes, and he was in such agony over the fact with his wife with Parkinson's and the fact that he felt that his advanced directives allowed him the opportunity to let her pass, um, unfortunately a little quicker than nature was going to have it, and the, both the medical and the social system uh, didn't agree with that, but um, I emailed uh, Barry the other day. He took about eight, nine days off and went to California when we finally convinced him to leave the house, right. and he's out there with his sister-in-law, and he's having for the first time in, a, in over a year an opportunity just to kind of smell the roses, get out and do a few things for himself and it's really important he'll be back on the third and I'm looking forward to seeing him and in, in the near future because he is going to still encounter the hospice system with his requests and I want to see what goes on with that I don't think it's going to change anything in the document but I want to see how he does when the system tries to explain to him as we did 
a few weeks ago right. why he can't have what he so desperately wants and what he thinks that he and his wife plan out for. Out of love. Out of love. Out of love. It's not out of selfishness. Man has full-time help and never leaves the house. He's there to do anything that he can for his wife. You know, that's kind of like a little bit of being a superhero. It sure You're is. You're right. Um, and he's suffering from it. The doctor has said you got too much stress, you got too much cardiac issue, your blood pressure's too high. His daughters came down. We had one of his daughters here. She didn't speak, but she was sitting in the background. She was going to kind of hopefully take over and be the in house person for mom for a few days, so he didn't feel so guilty, as it were, leaving. Mm hmm. And uh, and he seemed to be having uh, a little bit of a respite himself, so that was important. Especially around the holidays. Everybody needs it around the holidays. The holidays draw so many conclusions about what did we do this year, what kind of resolutions do we have to do to be different next year, how are we going to succeed where we didn't succeed in the past, and we have to be very careful when we do things like that. We have to manage our own expectations. You know, we're not superheroes, especially in caregiving. And that's why it's so important, and I'm going to be pushing it a lot more this year about planning. Uh, matter of fact, the, my book, all right, the Family Caregiver Practical Problem Solving Manual, which won the F Florida Council on Aging Award for the for the best media production this year. I'm just writing a few more. When you, when you do the plan that I have in the back after you've mm -hmm. understood a lot of the information, that's very easy to read, very easy to understand. It's not written in Metacles. It's not written in terms of social work. It's written by somebody who deals with caregivers every day. And when it gets to putting together the information in the questionnaire, you then have an opportunity to kind of write your little family plan. And while some people say, well, how do you do that? And there's a couple of examples in there. But I have learned a lot more, especially in this past year. Uh, and I may have made some of those examples a little too easy just to make it easy to follow. I'm leaving them in there, but I'm also taking advantage of some of the real complicated issues that I've helped people work through this year and and the the people in the support group who've helped it work people like yourself Paul who lend their intuition their experience and so I'm doing a couple that are a little more complicated so people don't come back and say well it's not that it's supposed to identify them precisely but what I'm trying to also do is raise the awareness that caregiving gets very complicated the longer you're in it the longer that you flounder the longer that you don't ask for help I think one of the ways that our listeners can envision it is that you shine a light on a pathway that you really don't know where it's actually going to go right and this gives you a tool to help you find your way down that pathway right and I think that one of the things we can say about caregiving, and you know it as well as I do, just when you think you understand where it's going, you know, it flips. <laughs> something happens. Something happens to you. Something happens to your loved one. Something goes on in the family that you just hadn't planned for. And all of a sudden, you feel like you're back at square one. And uh, so it's so important to be grounded when you're a caregiver. To, to be realistic about what you can do, what you can afford, how the system is going to treat you, what you can expect out of your doctor, your lawyer, your accountant, because they haven't taken courses in caregiving either. They can dispense their professional wisdom, but they're not necessarily going to get you through caregiving. And that's where things like support groups, things like, I think, my book, Others have written on the subject, talked about the subject, but I think I hone in on it from, from 25 years of dealing with caregivers every day. Well, that's why it won the award, David. It's quite an honor. You know, looking back on 2012, and certainly this was a highlight I know for, for you. I, I think it was 2013. 13. <laughs> My senior moment. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but looking back a little bit, one of the major changes that, we, that came about this year was regarding Medicaid. 
and I, I know the time, little time challenge, but I think this was really a significant event that happened. And maybe you can just give an overview of what was, what is now, and what might be, be coming. Yeah, what might be coming. All right. Well, if you recall that we had on uh, Jaime Fitzgerald from the Area Agency on Aging who called in. Uh, just when they were first beginning to roll out the program up on the Treasure Coast and they started in Palm Beach a couple of months ago. One of the things that's happened is essentially Medicaid is becoming managed care. And meaning what? Meaning that they are trying to get you into a situation where yes you're funded by Medicare but yet your health and how things are done are being done the same way that a Medicare Advantage program works. Now we have what's called Medicaid Option. Like, a, like an HMO. Like an HMO, um, so that there are panels of providers, facilities, who have contracted with Medicaid to deliver a service at a price so that hopefully that we can keep the costs of these services within reason. Um, however, we have to remember that these managed care organizations also need to make a profit. So they're going to be looking to keep things as tight as they can. Medicare, Medicaid rather, has historically been for those that do not have the ability to pay for services. And so we see a lot of Medicaid patients winding up in skilled nursing homes because that's the only place that Medicaid pays for full service. They do pay something that is called Medicaid diversion in this state, but it amounts to about $1,200 a month. And the concept is to keep you at home or keep you in your ALF, your assisted living facility, or wherever you may be, and not have to endure the costs of a nursing home and which are skyrocketing around the country and Florida is no exception. We have more than most but the prices are going up and um, they're having difficulty reaching a bottom line because they have so much Medicaid and Medicaid pays at a greatly reduced price and sometimes you just can't deliver the kind of service and the quality of care that you would like when the census of patients is predominantly Medicaid. But to, to finish up, so they're, they're enrolling people that are Medicaid eligible and those that are already on Medicaid into these managed programs and county by county, the state of Florida, the area agency on aging, uh, Department of Children and Families, Department of, of uh, Elder Affairs have all chimed in and have approved certain organizations in each county to manage and run Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And they have been making their way around to the various facilities, contracting with those facilities, and working as an almost like an insurer. So you'll see the Human is the United the Blues are all participating as well as um, newer organizations like American Elder Care, which was formed essentially out of what had been a Medicaid home health agency to now manage the care of people on Medicaid. And so the changes that are coming will be the push to try and do their best to keep you at home rather than putting you into a facility. And that is going to be difficult for some people because they really have reached a point in their own economic wherewithal and possibly the reason that they've gone where they've gone is because they've spent all their money on care up until now. And they have a spouse or a caregiver that's burnt out that r and their loved one really, especially when it's dementia, really needs to be in a facility they can't afford to pay for it privately. In many cases, that individual is beyond being able to go into an assisted living memory care, w which costs good money today. And most people do not have or had to abandon a while ago long-term care insurance yeah. because they couldn't afford it or they didn't buy it. Or by the time they discovered that they had a loved one who was sick, couldn't get they it. couldn't get the underwriting on it. So mm -hmm. uh, right now, Medicaid in the state of Florida with the rollout is a work in progress. 
there are good things, there are bad things, but it's too soon to make a value judgment about how it's really going to work. It's, it's similar to taking a look at affordable care. Um, and we're not going to get into that subject. But it's way too soon, and it's going to take a while for Obamacare, affordable care, whatever you want to call it, to roll out, see how it's going to work, see how it all fits together. Medicaid option is no different, no mm -hmm. different than where we're going to see Medicare morph to with Medicare Advantage programs. And the difficulty that we're going to find historically in this state as more and more doctors retire and we see an influx of more specialists and not as many general care practitioners which is really who we need to be the folks that kind of sort out what's going on so that people are not winding up self referring to specialists when a generalist might be able to take care of them don't get me wrong specialists are very very needed but one of the one of the things that Medicaid is trying to do is keep it in a manageable population and to try and keep those costs down because that's one of the runaway drivers in our economy is the cost of health care for those that really can't afford it and what people call an entitlement with Medicare but yet people paid for it all their lives when they worked. And yes. so it's, it's not an entitlement. It's simply a payback of what you paid for. It's insurance. Sure it is. And, um, and so, you know, that, that's my take on uh, Medicaid right now in Florida, in Palm Beach County. We're going to have uh, Jaime from the uh, area agency on probably in early February. He'll be able to give us a report on how well it's rolling out in our own backyard and it's rolling out in America. One question before we get off the topic. Within the, the, uh, the changeover of Medicaid, was there or are there supposed to be some sort of an educational component for the caregiver? There is. There is supposed to be a way to help educate the caregiver, whether that was going to be done by the home health care industry. Obviously, uh, case managers and nurses can give you some advice about how to take care of your loved one, but it's a little more clinical than it is social-emotional, and they really don't have the time at this point, even though those caregivers need it very, very much. And, you know, so we're just going to have to wait and see. 2014 is going to be a very important year. There are a lot of things that are going to happen, uh, a lot of things that hopefully will improve the situation, but I see also a lot of things on the horizon that if we don't get our hands around them, and it's not just money. You know, the, there was an article I wanted to go through tonight, but it, it's really taking to task the formal care system for putting so much of a burden on the family care system and just assuming that all the things that formal care doesn't have time for, can't do because it's home, whatever, that because you're a husband, a wife, a son, or a daughter, that automatically you know what to do. And you're talking about that education, but these are people that have to work. I mean, one of the things that we're going to see a huge impact on, and you and I have talked about it, is people are working longer in the workplace, mm -hmm. all right? And so you've got older people, and by the very nature of aging, you're going to find a lot more caregivers. If we have 39 percent in the general population, then we have at least 25 to 30 percent in the workplace. And now that people are willing, we talked about it last week, AARP reported that people are now actively considering working to 74, both to stay productive, but in many cases they lost so much in the last recession that if they don't work, they're not going to have anything for when they do retire or they don't have the wherewithal even right now to stay up with the medical and other issues. Many people have been living in a home for 10 or 15 years and Paul, you know this, didn't plan for the fact that the refrigerator needs to be replaced. The air conditioning is going to go out. If you're going to stay in a home and make it a, a location for caregiving, 
you have to make sure that the fundamentals work. It's no different than the fundamentals of caregiving. You got to have a plan. How are you going to turn over? You know what you need for essentials, and um, and caregiving is no different. All right, you just got to plan for your roof. And it's exacerbated by the fact that many caregivers not only have a parent or a spouse to take care of, they're finding children that are coming back to the house, including grandchildren, and in some cases, they're finding themselves responsible for the grandchildren as well. Well, uh, this, is, this is the product of, uh, of uh, a new and very different society. And, um, and while we are who we are in this electronic day and age, um, you know, we live and die on sound bites, and that and, you know, we are constantly being course corrected. And you know, one of the things I wanted to pass on is that the internet is a very important resource, but unless you know exactly where you're going, and this applies to caregiving as as well, very importantly, you don't know who you're getting advice from, where it came from, what their agenda is. Um, just like these memory tests that are online, right. there, there was a very important report that came out about a month ago that said most of the memory tests that are available online really have no validity. Wow. Because there are a bunch of simple questions and answers. You're supposed to self-score. When you see a real psychometric test, one that that's deep diving by a psychiatrist, a neurologist, whatever, to make a, a real determination on memory. It's a couple of hours. It's questions that reverse themselves to see whether or not you're trying to, not cheat on it, but whether or not you're trying to modify your answers. And so these quick and dirty, even though we always had something called a mini mental, you know, where uh, can you draw a clock? And that will tell us many things. Can you remember these three words uh, 15 minutes after I told them to you? But the things that we find on the Internet, we have to be very careful about because they're not Information is not wisdom. Right. Information is not wisdom. And information, when you don't know where the resource came from, uh, is always questionable. Folks, we've got about a minute to go. Paul, I want to thank you so much for all that you have contributed this year. I look forward to being able to work with you this coming year and in the years in the future. And to the audience, I must tell you that what we do is not our mission. It's our passion. We really believe in what we're doing. We really understand the caregiver. We're here to do two things. Number one treat you with the respect and dignity that you deserve and B, try and fill you in with the information that you need so that when you hear things if we haven't verified it <laughs> don't believe it and I know that sounds very egotistical but we do spend a lot of time making sure that what we bring you is accurate is informative and that this is what we're going to be doing in the future. I want to wish everybody a healthy, happy, prosperous new year. Freddie, I want to thank you for everything you've done this year as a producer. Geo, same thing goes. And folks, uh, happy new year. Happy new year and enjoy it. We'll see you next Monday. You have been listening and watching David Levy Gerontology.